Let me start by saying this. I'm not one of those guys who believes in ghosts and premonitions. I never have been. The kind of stuff you read about online. Creepy prophecies coming true. Out-of-body experiences. People seeing their own deaths. It always seemed like made-up nonsense to me. Or maybe the ramblings of seriously messed. Up, folks. Well, maybe I judged too quickly. You see, two nights ago, I got a glimpse of how I'm going to die. I know the date. The place. Even the messed up way I'm going to kick the bucket. The thing that makes this extra freaky is... Ah, saw it all through my own eyes. Well, sort of. Let me try and explain. It was a regular Tuesday night. The kind with nothing worth writing home about. I'd just microwaved a sad-looking frozen dinner. You know the ones I mean. Settled on the couch with a lukewarm beer and flicked on reruns of some stupid reality show. Then, it started. As a flicker in my vision. Right at the corner of my eye. At first, I chalked it up to some weird trick of the light from the TV. But it happened again. This time, it wasn't just a flicker. It was a scene. Super vivid and totally foreign. A long, dark hallway with a single flickering fluorescent bulb overhead. My stomach lurched. I wasn't sitting in my own apartment anymore. I was inside this hallway. Yet something was off. This wasn't a regular memory. And it wasn't like watching a movie either. I could feel the stale air on my skin, smell the faint trace of bleach in the air, even hear the distant buzz of that flickering light. Then there was me, my future self, a little older, a few more wrinkles, but definitely me. I watched myself walk down that dingy hallway, my footsteps echoing into the emptiness. My face was tight with an unease I felt down to my own bones. It was more than being creeped out. It was this gut-level dread. Whatever was waiting at the end of that hall, I knew I didn't want to find it. Then, the scene ripped away like an old curtain being yanked down. Blinking. I was back. Beer cans scattered on the carpet. The reality show still blaring mindlessly. My first thought was that I must off tot was that I must have dozed off, had a seriously messed up nightmare. Except that hallway, the unease that lingered heavy in my chest. I decided the best thing was to forget it, shove the whole thing down. But just when the memory started to fade, when I thought I was in the clear, another vision hit me. This time, it was worse. That same me from the hallway turned a corner, and there it was, an empty room, bare concrete walls stained with. I don't even want to think about it. And slumped on the floor, another me. Me. Dead. Or at least dying. My future self stared down at my corpse in horror. Then the vision fizzled out, leaving just the sound of the TV and my own racing heartbeat. My hands were clammy, sweat dripping down my brow. My thoughts swirled. Was this some kind of superpower gone wrong? A warning from the future? But the biggest question that kept gnawing at me. The first night after the visions was sleepless. Those scenes kept replaying in my head like some twisted horror movie I couldn't switch off. I tossed and turned. The image of myself, lifeless, crumpled on that cold floor, burned into my mind. By the time the first rays of sunlight started to creep through the blinds, I was a shaking wreck of a human. Morning brought a hollow kind of resolve. I couldn't just wallow in terror. I needed answers, or at least a way to prove to myself that my mind was playing tricks. Logically, it made no sense. How could I see the future? That fluorescent lit hallway, that grim room. I'd never been to a place like that in my life. And I definitely didn't have a twin roaming out there heading straight for his own grisly demise. But what if the logic was wrong? The visions were too real to dismiss. So I made a decision that now, looking back, was probably the beginning of my unraveling. I decided to try and recreate the scene from my vision. If I could find that hallway, walk its echoing length, at least it would feel like I was taking some kind of control. 
my apartment suddenly felt suffocating. I showered, threw on whatever I could find, and took off on foot. No plan. Just this compulsion to walk, to search. I wandered through neighborhood streets, my mind churning, eyes darting, half expecting the dingy hallway to simply appear, a twisted landmark on an otherwise familiar road. After what felt like hours, I stopped, slumping against a wall to catch my breath. I was nowhere, completely lost. More than that, I was starting to fear that being lost might be the best, case scenario. Because with every block that didn't match the vision, a cold certainty started creeping in. That hallway did exist somewhere in the city, and sooner or later, I was going to wind up at its door. Then it happened. A turn onto a narrow side street, and there it was. The old brick building, a peeling sign declaring it some kind of abandoned storage facility, and right alongside. Entrance to that blasted fluorescent dungeon. The same cracked cement, a faint flicker of light above, the sickening scent of panic kicked in full force. Legs, run, mind, turn away. But something stronger, a desperate kind of curiosity, propelled me forward. I didn't think, just shoved it open and stepped inside, the hallway exactly as I'd seen it in the vision swallowing me up. Each footstep a hammer blow. One corner, then another. That was where I'd turned and seen it. The room. My breath hitched as I approached. I couldn't just peer in, but some force was driving me onward. And there it was, that horrible place from my vision laid out before me. Bare, cold, with those horrifying stains. But the stains were fresh. Crimson, still wet, smearing across the concrete floor. And the body. Not mine, not mine. Another man my age, eyes staring blankly, a dark pool forming around him. I doubled over, vomiting. I don't know how long I knelt there, but then I heard them, voices, footsteps echoing down the hallway towards me. Panic was a wildfire blazing through me. The voices were louder now, and I could make out rough, angry tones. There were at least two of them coming closer with every slamming footstep. I had to get out, but as I scrambled to my feet, nausea and terror turned my legs to jelly. Blind instinct propelled me, not away from the voices, but deeper into the facility. It made no sense, but my vision kept flashing to that awful room at the end of the hall, like it was the only possible destination. The hallway stretched out, a mocking gauntlet, each flickering of the overhead light became a strobe spotlight pinning me down. Every squeak and bang of the old building felt like the hunters were closing in. With every gasping breath, the coppery stench of blood seemed to cling heavier to me. I stumbled around another corner, and there it was. The room. There was no more hiding. I lurched inside, slamming the flimsy metal door shut behind me. It wouldn't hold them for long, but it might just buy me a few precious seconds to... What? Think? Hide? Pray? The room mocked me with its emptiness. Bare walls. The lingering, sickening smell. Nothing I could use for defense. Nowhere I could disappear. Except wait. In my vision, there had been no window. But here, grimy and high on the wall, was a cracked, dusty window overlooking a trash-strewn alleyway. It was high, way too high, but it existed. It was a sliver of hope, or at least something other than the door, and those voices that were almost upon me. I lunged for an old wooden crate beneath the window, shoving it with every ounce of my trembling strength. It was nearly enough if I could just... The door to the room slammed open with a bang that rattled my teeth. Two burly figures stood there, faces masked in dust and shadows. I scrambled onto the crate, my fingers scrabbling for purchase on the grimy window pane. One of the figures advanced, a flash of something metallic in their gloved hand. Desperation gave me a last burst of energy. I heaved myself up, smashing through the window with a shower of glass. Pain sliced through my shoulder as I plummeted, half falling, 
half jumping into the alley. I hit the ground hard, rolling to avoid crushing my legs beneath concrete and rusty dumpsters. Groaning, I forced myself to stand. There were shouts from the window above me. They'd seen me escape. There was no time to worry about injuries. My legs churned, driven by pure adrenaline. I weaved through the labyrinth of alleyways, not knowing my destination, knowing only the need to put distance between myself and that dreadful room. Finally, I collapsed behind a dumpster, gasping for breath, sobs racking my chest. It was only now that the full weight of it all hit me. The visions hadn't been a nightmare. They were prophecy, and the fresh body. It proved my grim fate was a terrifyingly real possibility. Those men had been in my vision too, lurking figures I hadn't understood. Now they'd seen me, knew I'd stumbled across their crime. Was I even safe here? Were they already hunting me down? Each rattle in the alley became a footstep. Each flicker of light felt like a spotlight, felt like a spotlight, pinning me to my miserable hiding place. This was it then. The horrible twist. Those visions hadn't just shown me how I might die. They would led me straight into the bloody trap. My lungs were on fire, and I tasted blood with every ragged breath. My escape had been a blur of instinct and desperation, not strategy. The alley twisted and turned, a grimy maze designed to disorient and trap. The adrenaline rush was fading, leaving a shivering wreck in its wake. My injured shoulder throbbed with a white-hot agony that made me whimper. I had to find somewhere, anywhere, to hide. And that meant getting out of this alley death trap. Just when I thought I couldn't take another step, the alley opened up into a small, trash-strewn lot. Across it, cars zipped along a dingy side street. Civilization, or at least something outside this nightmare maze. I stumbled out into the open, barely managing to dodge a rusted-out truck that roared past, its tires spitting up gravel and exhaust. Drivers cursed, but no one slowed. No one seemed to even register a blood-soaked, wild-eyed figure emerging from the shadows. Maybe that was a twisted kind of blessing. I had to focus. Which way to go? The visions of my future death offered no geographical clues. All I was sure of was that whatever happened next, I couldn't afford to attract attention. No hospitals, no cops, no passers-by stopping to help. I was a walking trail of evidence, back to that horrible room, a witness the criminals I'd seen couldn't risk leaving alive. There had to be options. My hands shook as I fumbled with my phone. The screen cracked and splattered with grime. But there was a signal, a connection to a world not yet painted with my own blood. Someone had to listen. Someone had to. No. My thumb hovered over the emergency call button. Would the police even believe a rambling story about visions and an impossible murder scene? Before they'd even begin to help, I'd be locked up in a padded room, my words dismissed as the delusions of a madman. Then who? Surely there was someone. My fingers swiped through contacts, blurring through panicked tears. Friends, family, ordinary, normal people whose lives didn't involve visions of death and shadowy murderers. Calling them would bring this horror into their safe, well-lit worlds. It wasn't an option. Then, like a beacon, one name burned through the mental fog. Sarah, she was. Different, she collected odd tales, dabbled in the fringes of the paranormal, laughed off ghost stories and cryptic online prophecies with a wink, but never quite ruled them out entirely. If anyone would at least listen without immediately labeling me insane, it was her. Hands trembling, I pressed the call button, then held the phone to my ear, my breath loud in the sudden silence. One ring. Alex? Is that you? It's like, three, um, man, what's so important? Her voice, usually warm and lightly teasing, crackled with sleepiness and confusion. My chest tightened. Sarah, listen, you have to listen. I... The rest 
poured out of me. The visions, the storage room, the body, the escape. Sarah was silent at first, the line buzzing with a low static that seemed to echo the pounding of my own heart. Finally, when it seemed like the silence would stretch on forever, she spoke. Her voice had lost the sleepy fuzz, replaced by a sharp edge. That is, she paused as if searching for the right words. That's heavy stuff, Alex. But look, you were probably asleep, had a nightmare. You gotta calm down. No. The word burst from me, desperate and raw. You don't get it. This was real. I need help, Sarah. I don't know what to do. Okay. Okay. Her tone shifted again, now trying to sound soothing. Where are you? Maybe I can come. We can talk about this face to face. My mouth went dry. No, I can't. No one can know where I am. Those men. Those... I choked on the words. I think they were going to kill me. The silence on the line was deafening. Sarah, my voice dropped to a near whisper, fear clawing at me again. Alex, listen, I understand you're scared. You've been through a lot, but... She sighed. Maybe you should consider getting help. The call ended abruptly. I gaped at the phone in disbelief. Had she hung up on me? My only lifeline, and she just dismissed me. I almost threw the phone in a fit of rage, but then a flicker of understanding of bitter, icy awareness crept into my gut. Why should she believe me any more than the cops would have? This wasn't Sarah's world. This was my fresh hell, and I was in it alone. The phone, cold and dead in my hand, was a stark tombstone against the growing light of dawn. Sarah, my last shred of hope, was gone, dismissed, vanished back into the world where nightmares were just bad dreams. She was lucky. Now, the early morning buzz of the city was my enemy. Garbage trucks roared past, workers hurried to catch buses, dog walkers gossiped, all blissfully unaware of the monstrous shadow that had fallen across my world. I wanted to scream, beg someone, anyone, to just listen. But how do you explain visions and prophecies to a stranger without sounding like a raving lunatic? Survival instinct kicked in, overriding the despair. I couldn't stay here. Those men, whoever they were, might already be scouring the neighborhood. I needed to disappear. But where? Who could hide me, a fugitive with no story anyone would believe? Then, a twisted memory flickered through my panic. My dad. We weren't close, hadn't been for years. A lifetime of unspoken resentments and arguments lay between us like an impenetrable wall. But he had a cabin, deep in the woods, hours from the city. He cherished his solitude, so he wouldn't welcome a surprise visit especially not from a son who'd become a stranger, but it was a chance, may be my only one. The problem was getting there. Every bus, every train was a potential trap. Stealing a car was too risky, would paint me a common criminal, far easier to catch. There had to be another way, some overlooked option. I started walking, not towards any destination, just away from that cursed alley. I needed to think, to plan, but my brain felt like it was stuffed with cotton wool. My shoulder screamed in protest at each jarring step, but the pain was a grounding presence, at least something real amid this nightmare. Hours passed in a blur of dingy streets and growling stomachs. I couldn't risk stopping for food, couldn't afford to be noticed. Finally, on a near deserted road lined with old warehouses, something caught my eye. A pawn shop. The tacky neon sign in the grimy window blinked on and off like a mocking pulse. It wasn't a solution, but it might buy me a piece of one. 
I pushed open the grimy door, a bell jangling as I stepped into the musty gloom of the shop. The old man behind the counter was straight out of a cliché. Greasy hair, thick glasses, a permanent frown etched into a face that had seen a thousand shady deals. He looked up as I approached, those eyes narrowing with suspicion. Can I help you? His voice was rough, edged with a distrust that mirrored my own. I need to sell something. My battered phone came out of my pocket. It was worthless to me now, but maybe here it could buy me a few hours head start. The pawnbroker snatched it, examining the cracked screen. He scoffed. Ain't worth much. Busted like that. Anything is better than nothing, I rasped, the desperation breaking through my careful composure. After some haggling, I walked out with a wad of crumpled bills in my pocket. Not much, but enough for a bus ticket to the dusty one. Horsetown near my dad's cabin. The first leg of an escape I wasn't even sure was possible. The bus station was a purgatory of tired faces and scuffed luggage. Each time the automated voice announced a new departure, I jolted, the knot in my stomach tightening. Were those footsteps behind me getting closer? Did that man glancing at me recognize me from the news? If the police were even involved yet? My ticket was for the last bus of the day. The hours until then stretched on endlessly. I found a dark corner, trying to blend in to become invisible. Hunger gnawed at me, but I clenched my teeth. Buying food meant drawing attention. Water was the furthest I could risk, sipped slowly from a grimy fountain to make it last. Finally, as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows, it was time. The bus was a battered old thing, its seats creaking ominously. I picked one at the very back, eyes darting constantly, looking for any sign of pursuit. The engine rumbled to life, and with a lurch, we were on the highway. The city lights began to dwindle, replaced by the stark blackness of rural night. It felt strangely comforting. Maybe out here, amid the trees and the quiet, the world made some kind of sense again. Maybe out here, I could breathe, could think. My dad's cabin was a good hour's walk from the nearest bus stop. When I finally stumbled up the overgrown path, my legs were shaking, and sweat stung my wounded shoulder. But there was a grim satisfaction, too. It felt like a small victory, a tiny act of defiance against the shadows that hunted me. The cabin was, as I remembered it, a small, slightly ramshackle building, scent of pine needles sharp in the chilly air. I hadn't been here in, what, five years? since before mom died. And dad, well, dad and I had drifted apart long before that. There wouldn't be a warm welcome, but I was beyond caring about hurt feelings. I just needed a safe place, even for a night or two, to figure out the next step in this impossible game of survival. The key was under the ugly ceramic frog by the door, the same cheesy hiding place from my childhood. It turned in the rusty lock with a groan, and I pushed the door open, stepping into a thick layer of dust and memory. The musty smell of the cabin was a thick blanket over my fear. It was the smell of neglect, of abandonment. Like the place itself, my relationship with my dad was covered in a film of dust, barely recognizable. He wasn't going to be happy seeing me. But at this point, fear of an angry dad was pretty low on my list of problems. I flipped a dusty light switch. A single yellow bulb sputtered to life, casting the main room in a sickly glow. The place was just as I remembered. The old plaid couch, the mismatched chairs, the walls covered in taxidermy deer heads with eerie, glassy eyes. There was a kitchen off to one side, a narrow hallway leading further in. My memory painted in the dim outlines of two small bedrooms and a bathroom bare essentials, everything a man who liked to be left alone would need. My stomach rumbled, reminding me that it had been a very long day fueled by terror, not food. But the cupboards held only stale crackers and dented cans of who knows. What? Survival wouldn't be glamorous here. Exhaustion was an anvil chained to my body, 
The couch looked like it might harbor untold critters, but the floor seemed marginally less disgusting. I spread my jacket out, curled up on the cold wood, and willed sleep to find me. It was fitful, fragmented, chunks of nightmare mixed with the strange half-wakefulness of sleeping somewhere unfamiliar. The deer heads loomed like silent accusers in the gloom, and every creak and groan of the cabin became footsteps in the hallway. I bolted awake to a gray, drizzly dawn seeping through the dusty windows. My shoulder throbbed. I was cold, hungry, and the despair was creeping back in now that the adrenaline had faded. What was I doing here? My dad would just toss me out, and then what? Back on the run, back on the run, back to the city where those men were no doubt searching. No, there had to be another way. Maybe, just maybe, the isolation was a good thing. Time to think, time to think, to plan. If I used these few days wisely, I could come up with something better than being hunted like an animal back into their trap. First, I needed supplies. The little town down the road had to have a store, something less depressing than those canned goods. The walk would be risky, but staying here was no longer a sustainable option either. Washing up in the tiny, grimy bathroom was more symbolic than actually effective, but I felt a bit more human afterward. I dug through my backpack for the cleanest shirt I could find. There was no use looking ragged. That would just draw more unwanted attention. The trail to town wound through dense woods. The drizzle made the air smell sharp and clean, a world away from the city's grime. Usually, I would have enjoyed it, but every rustle in the undergrowth made me jump, and I kept imagining eyes peering at me from the shadows. The town was the epitome of quaint. A general store with a faded sign, a diner that probably served the best pie in the county, and a post office straight out of a Norman Rockwell painting. It was all so normal, so safe looking. The general store was a treasure trove compared to my dad's meager pantry. I loaded a basket with essentials, bread, peanut butter, bottled water, even threw in a candy bar as a defiant little luxury. Trying not to look suspicious, I added first aid kit. My shoulder needed proper care. The old woman at the register clucked sympathetically over my scrapes and bruises while ringing me up. You boys get into a rough patch of woods. A uh, mountain biking accident, I mumbled, painfully aware of how transparent my lie must have seemed. I hurried out, half, expecting her to yell after me to wait for the sheriff. The walk back to the cabin felt longer, my basket growing heavier, not from the weight of the supplies, but from the knowledge that I was now leaving a trail. If those men came looking, this town would be a logical starting point. But what choice did I have? Back at the cabin, I ate ravenously, then forced myself to address my injured shoulder. Cleaning the cuts and awkwardly wrapping them with the gauze from the kit was a miserable, painful ordeal. But the ache began to lessen, and I allowed myself a small flicker of hope. The rest of the day was a battle against time and my own spiraling thoughts. I tried to be rational, to think like someone in a crime movie. What would those men do? What would those men do? Would they even bother with a backwoods town? Had they already found the body and was my face now plastered on the evening news? Each time I drifted close to figuring something out, the visions would come crashing back in, a twisted mockery of logic. I saw myself stumbling through those woods, saw the glint of metal in the trees, saw thyself on the ground in a spreading pool of crimson that wasn't mine this time. By nightfall, I was more of a wreck than when I'd arrived. The isolation I thought would help was suffocating me. The cabin was a prison now, and the woods. They were full of unseen watchers. I sat, huddled on the couch with a flickering flashlight as my only feeble weapon against the monstrous darkness. Sleep was my enemy, a traitor luring me into a world of whispers and shadows where the visions waited to pounce. I spent the long, dark hours curled on the floor, my only weapon, the feeble beam of my dying flashlight, twitching awake at every creak of the cabin. 
By sunrise, I was shivering, a desperate, ragged mess. I couldn't stay here, not just because of the fear, but because this isolation was doing a number on my mind. If those visions were the key to everything, I needed clarity to untangle them, which meant finding somewhere less likely to drive me insane before lunch. The woods were out of the question. They were no longer just trees and fallen leaves. They whispered threats, hit eyes I couldn't see but felt burning into me, which left only one option, the town. It had seemed so safe in the daylight, but now it was a potential minefield. Still, the risk felt smaller than the gnawing terror in that cabin. Before leaving, I forced down a few stale crackers. Food wouldn't win any awards, but it was fuel, and I'd need my strength. I crammed a few supplies into my backpack, then hesitated. The old hunting rifle above the fireplace. Was it crazy to consider taking it? I barely knew how to load the thing, but it was better than a flashlight for facing. Whatever might be out there. As I reluctantly hefted the gun, guilt gnawed at me. My dad, with his solitary ways and gruff exterior, he hadn't deserved this invasion. But my desperation strangled the guilt. The walk to town was a jittery nightmare. Every rustling leaf, even the bird song, made me jump. The rifle clutched tight. My shoulder ached in a dull, steady throb. A reminder of why I was on this insane run in the first place. Yet, as I drew nearer to those quaint shops and tidy houses, a twisted kind of calm settled over me. The ordinary had become extraordinary. A woman walking her dog. Kids laughing in a playground. It was a world ripped from any story I'd known before the visions. Each peaceful sight was like a balm to my tortured mind. I found myself in front of the diner. The smell of coffee and bacon was a siren song to my starved senses. But as I pushed open the door, the cheerful jingle of the bell on the door felt jarringly loud. Every head turned towards me. I saw the mix of curiosity, pity, and something sharper in their eyes. Recognition. My hand tightened on the rifle. Had the news somehow reached this place already? Were they seeing me, the fugitive, the walking dead man from my visions? I half turned to run, but something stopped me. A waitress, a kindly woman with a worn face, bustled over. Hun, you look like you just saw a ghost. Come on, sit. Coffee's on the house. I blinked at her, the words barely registering. Then I forced my feet to move, sliding into a booth, the rifle awkwardly propped beside me. I couldn't explain my fear, couldn't share even the smallest fragment of this horrifying weight crushing me. Coffee appeared, strong and blessedly hot. I took a sip that seared my throat anything to ground myself. The world hadn't morphed entirely. Hot coffee still burned. People still showed random acts of kindness. But maybe that was my mistake. Clinging to the world as it was supposed to be instead of focusing on the warped new reality I'd been thrown into. The waitress was back, this time with a plate piled high with pancakes and a reassuringly fake smile. There you go, sweetie. Eat up. A body can't run on fear alone. And that's when it hit me. That word, run. She wasn't looking at me like I was the madman in news. She looked at me the way you do at some scraggly stray animal. My clothes, the dirt, the haunted look in my eyes. I was just another piece of small town gossip, not their next murder headline. I ate, the food almost tasteless. Yet each bite was a defiance against the despair that tried to swallow me whole. The diner was an anchor, a tiny patch of normalcy where my visions held no power. For today, at least, they had lost. After paying, I made a detour to the general store, restocking my meager supplies. The old lady at the register hummed a cheery tune as she rang me up, oblivious to the internal struggle waging war within me. Maybe staying in town was possible, after all. Find some odd jobs. Lay low. It was risky, but infinitely better than the madness that awaited in the woods. 
As I stepped back outside, bag of groceries in hand, the normalcy shattered. A black sedan, sleek and out of place on the quaint main street, slowed to a stop in front of me. My breath hitched. Were these the men who'd been at the storage room? Had they tracked me here? The car door swung open, but the figure that emerged was not the rough thugs I'd expected. It was a man in a crisp suit that screamed expense, far more Wall Street than backwoods dirt roads. He was older, maybe in his 50s, with perfectly styled silver hair and a face carved in calm lines. I didn't recognize him, yet there was a sense of familiarity about him, which made absolutely no sense. Alex. His voice was smooth, the kind you expect from news anchors. Not fear, but icy shock flooded through me. He knew my name. Who are you? The words rasped out raw. A ghost of a smile twitched at his lips. We have a lot to discuss. Why don't you get in the car? Before my panicked brain could process, a flicker snagged my attention. One of those damn visions was trying to shove its way through. I saw myself, but not the hunted, ragged animal I'd become. I was sitting in that sleek car, driving off with the stranger. In the vision, I was no longer prey. I was willing. Confusion warred with the terror that was now my constant companion. But if those visions were truly a glimpse of the future, maybe this man wasn't part of the threat, but part of the solution. I made a decision, one born more from desperation than logic. I slid into the pristine leather passenger seat, letting the door slam shut, sealing me in. As the sedan glided away from that picture, perfect town, I wasn't sure if I felt relief or a fresh kind of terror coiling in my gut. The man beside me, Mr. Smith, if the engraved business card was to be believed, spoke in measured tones, not about threats, not about visions, but about, you have a rare gift, Alex, he said. Eyes focused on the road like my life. Altering premonitions were nothing more than the weather report, a connection to time, to the threads that weave our world. I scoffed, a bitter laugh escaping me. Yeah, right, a gift. Tell that to the guys trying to kill me. His expression didn't change. Those men, they were outliers, distortions in the timeline you sensed. We're interested in helping you understand those distortions, helping you control them. I stared at him, trying to make sense of the insanity. Were these people even crazier than me? My visions were a curse, a waking nightmare, not some untapped potential, but a desperate tendril of hope snaked its way through the fear. Could this be a way out? Mr. Smith's destination, when we finally arrived, was the last place I expected. A sprawling, high-tech complex hidden among rolling hills. It was a bizarre clash of gleaming chrome and old-growth trees. He led me down sterile corridors, past people in lab coats scribbling complex equations on transparent whiteboards. This is Kronos, he announced, a hint of pride in his voice an organization dedicated to the study and manipulation of time. We think you're the key to a breakthrough. My head spun. These people weren't just going along with my visions. They'd built a whole, a whole company around them. Either they were all deluded, or this was some kind of elaborate trap. Yet, an undeniable curiosity battled with my instincts to run. For weeks, Kronos was my new reality. It was part science, part something I couldn't name. There were machines that hummed and sparked, researchers poring over ancient texts, and me. The lab rat caught in the center. They tested me, monitored me, pushed the limits of my visions. It was exhausting, frightening, but there was a strange exhilaration to it, too. They taught me things that upended everything I thought was true. That time wasn't linear, but a tangled river with eddies and backwaters. That my visions weren't prophecy, but glimpses into those other branches. Each vision was a potential future, not a certain one. And the most mind-bending of all, it was possible to deliberately shift those currents, 
not change the past, but nudge events onto a different path. Suddenly, my haunted visions weren't a dead end, but a starting point. I was the anomaly, the wildcard Kronos had bet everything on. Of course, there were the dangers, the headaches that seared into my skull when I pushed too hard, the flickers at the edge of my sight, where reality threatened to fray and twist, and Mr. Smith, always hovering, watching his investment pay off. He spoke of a greater good of using our newfound knowledge to prevent tragedies, but there was a sharp glint in his eyes that scared me far more than any criminal ever could. But I also found unexpected allies. There was Dr. Tanaka, a brilliant and endlessly patient woman who saw me as more than a puzzle to be solved. She showed me how to meditate to ground myself in the chaos. There was Ben, another Kronos recruit, his visions less vivid than mine, but his control far greater. He taught me to fight back against the overwhelming tide of futures. One day, as we worked on shifting a small object a few inches across a table, a bolt of pure terror shot through me, a vision more vivid and immediate than ever before. I saw the Kronos facility engulfed in flames, people screaming. Mr. Smith's smile warped into a vicious mask of triumph, and I was the catalyst, my out-of-control ability the spark. This wasn't a future possibility. It was a ticking time bomb, and the clock was counting down. I couldn't tell Tanaka or Ben. Mr. Smith's surveillance was too tight. This was a fight I had to face alone. The Alex who'd stumbled into this complex was a scared, desperate kid. Kronos had taught me focus, given me a glimpse of power. It was time to turn that power back on them. Escape wasn't enough. It would just paint an even larger target on my back. Mr. Smith would find me, exploit me. The only way to end this was to make sure there was no Kronos to come back to. I spent my days in training, pretending to hone my ability, all the while planning something far more destructive. It was sabotage on a scale I never could have imagined before. Tweaking machine calibrations, subtly manipulating Ben's exercises to create a cascade effect within their systems, laying down the groundwork for a disaster they'd never see coming. The night I chose, a storm raged outside, a perfect cover. I triggered the sequence, the sense of wrongness twisting my gut. Sirens wailed, a controlled chaos that would soon spin entirely beyond control. As I slipped out a back exit, the first burst of flame licked at a window pane. The visions of Kronos burning haunted me as I ran, but somewhere beneath it flickered something else. Not triumph, but grim satisfaction. I had turned the tables. I hadn't just been the victim, the hunted. I'd become the hunter. The world was once again my enemy. I was back to bus stops and stolen food. The adrenaline of escape, my only constant companion. But I wasn't the same Alex who'd stumbled into that fluorescent nightmare. I had knowledge, a kind of terrible power. And even with the constant fear whispering at the back of my mind, there was a defiance that hadn't been there before. Because the biggest question still loomed. My death. Was it still waiting for me out there, inevitable? Or had my defiance changed that future too? I didn't know the answer. And maybe it was better that way. All I knew was I'd keep moving, keep fighting, and refuse to become just another one of my own grim prophecies. Thanks for listening. If you like the story, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, and I look forward to your comments. See you in the next video.